you had to break this land. It had to be broke. Reminiscing the days of our lives. Reminiscing the years and the times that we recall. History was made for us. You know, on the side house, the windows is about that wide, you know. Mm -hmm. I used to set up there. And the years, and the hours, and the minutes move quickly by. And the days fade away, and the moment never to anywhere. No such thing as a gravel road around the cook or even in the country. And uh, the street right here is just a bad Each of us touch many lives in a lifetime. Our own lives are enriched by being touched by others. My name is Bill Watson, and my life was touched by the personalities and recollections of the 14 men and women that were interviewed for this program. These people grew up with the 20th century in southwest Nebraska. They grew up without the modern conveniences that we take for granted. They built their homes, went to school, were married, worked and played with the same zest and love that we see in our best people today. Let me introduce these men and women to you. Harry Thorndike, 87 years old, and his wife Ada, 88 years old, are living in Cambridge, where Harry retired from operating his general merchandise store. Both enjoy being together and visiting their children. Adolph Tuman, a retired banker from Trenton, is 89 years old now living at the Heritage Plaza in Cambridge. He enjoys reading and renewing old friendships. Josie Hines is 105 years old. She lives at the Muse Good Samaritan Home in Arapaho. Quilting is a favorite activity for Josie. She also plays the organ for Sunday church services. Alice Steber lives alone in Cambridge. At the age of 94, she keeps house and enjoys working in her garden. Playing her grand piano is one of Maud Lee Butler's pleasant pastimes as she resides at the Heritage Plaza in Cambridge. Maud Lee is 90 years old. She was a sister-in-law to the late Senator Hugh Butler. Lois Shiflett, 77 years old, farms north of Cambridge with her daughter. She finds pleasure being with her great-grandchildren. Dow Newcomb, 89 years old, is a retired farmer. His wife, Pearl Newcomb, 85 year years old, is a housewife. They now live in Cambridge. Dow likes to work in his yard and garden while Pearl enjoys crocheting and taking care of her plants. Another resident of the Heritage Plaza in Cambridge is Carl Seebecker. He is also a retired farmer. He is 87 years old. At 81 years, Josephine Trosper lives alone in Cambridge, belongs to many clubs, plays the piano, reads, and participates in church activities. 
Leonard Eubanks is close to celebrating his 85th birthday. He still farms north of Cambridge. He likes to work in his shop and tinker at fixing things such as engines and tractors. Mrs. Harry Strunk, 86 years old, has been active in the operation of the McCook Gazette newspaper, of which her late husband was the publisher. She lives alone in McCook, where she continues to take an active part in the McCook Gazette as co-publisher with her son, Alan D. Strunk. From the time he was 15 years old, Ray Search of McCook worked in theaters. Now 76 years old, Ray ran the Fox Theater of McCook. Since his retirement, he fishes, takes care of his yard, and has built and furnished a cabin. He enjoys his church work and continues to actively support the Great Plains Museum in his city. It has been said that times, places, and circumstances change, but worthwhile attitudes are changeless. Let's find out. feeding the stock. Were there any activities, say, that you children did? No, they wasn't. A, and the kids, we lived quite a little ways apart. And every time why we'd have a little doings, why they always would uh, have a, a Sunday school. That was one thing. We were pretty lucky in this locality. We had a Sunday school that we could attend. And that helped a whole lot. Were there many churches in the area when you first? No. Uh -uh. They. Uh, there wasn't any churches close to us, the Soul Sleepers. You heard of them? The Soul Sleepers. Soul Sleepers is the name of them. And when the schoolhouse was down here, why, they used to, I went to Sunday school there every summer because they would teach Sunday school there, and then they'd have meetings every so often and everything. I went to that. I used to remember. My folks uh, had the barn and milk and down south and kind of in the canyon, you know, and the night I could set up there, you know, on the side house, the windows was about that wide, you know. Mm -hmm. I used to set up there and watch for them to come back from milking. Did you have any trouble with the cold or the heat in those side houses? No, not that way, but uh, I can remember when we used to get some awful hard rains. And you know, the roof, the sod house had sod for a roof on it, mm -hmm. had boards and then sod on top of that. And you know, it rained a lot, that got pretty heavy. Uh -huh. And I know my dad had to get some stuff and brace the roof up so to hold it out. They dug out in uh, the bank, you know, uh, I mean, a big one. So there, there was four bedrooms and then they dug a back in under the there and made a cellar for to keep their milk mm -hmm. and butter and we lived over there until 87 when they started then when they started to make our sod house this sod house here in 87 we say it got here in november and you couldn't work they couldn't break sod then and start a house fancy. So they had to live with the uh, grandpas until spring of 87. Then's when that sod house and sod barn was built. Did you have any trouble with animals, uh, snakes or fleas yeah. or anything? <laughs> yes, I did. They used to have under the eaves of the house sod, you know, there'd be places like that between the boards and the mm -hmm. sod. and. Uh, Birds would make nests up in there, and some of our neighbor had two neighbor friends that we used to play with each other a lot, and they'd come over and we'd reach up in under the eave there and uh, get them nests out. And a girl was older than us two boys, and she'd do that, and she put her hand on a snake one time. <laughs> Didn't get bit though, did she? No. I bet she got out of the way pretty yeah, quick. Well, we didn't do that anymore. Oh, we had to take care of the horses, milk two or three cows, and general chore work, feed the hogs, uh -huh. and also feed the cattle when it's wintertime. 
What was it like during winter in those early days? Did uh, we... Well, we had some pretty tough winters, a few of them. And then we had some awful nice winters. But when it was bad, it was bad because none of the roads is open like they are today. They was out to the prairie and gates to open to go to town. And we had to go about four miles before you run out of public road, before you run into a public road to go to town. And what was it like being the daughter of a judge? Well, you got in on a lot of uh, secrets, I guess, that you didn't dare tell. I learned at an early age that uh, you, that there were private things and there were things that you could talk about. Did that sort of uh, was that awfully difficult for a young girl to keep quiet at that time? Or? Well, uh, at times, but then we had pretty well drilled into us. We brought a hundred foot tower in the front of it, and it had a clock in the tower that had a face on the south and the east and the north, and it had a bell that struck every half hour, just like. Uh, and the, the clock was uh, powered by weights, just like a big cuckoo clock. And my brother and I, we had the job of uh, winding this clock once a week. It was a six to seven day clock. And to wind it, these weights, I, would, I presume they would weigh six, between six, eight hundred, maybe nine hundred pounds. And we'd go up into the top of the tower and they had winches. One for the action and one for the one for the bell, just like a cougar clock. And we'd go up there and we'd run off to each side of the big crank, and we'd crank those weights. Uh, the weights went from the top of the tower down in about 20 feet underground, right through the tower. And we'd crank these weights to the top of the tower. We get the first we get to the sound, we get the uh, action of the clock all taken care of. Then we go to the other side of the tower and crank up the weights for the bell. Well, it took a lot more power. But I bet you couldn't guess how much we, uh, what our pay was for keeping that clock running. No idea. The pigeons we'd get out of the belfry. <clears throat> I understand you used to give people music lessons. Yes. Would you I like to tell around in the country with a buggy, horse and buggy, and drive around. And they took me get music lessons. Yeah, I do that. What kind of music lessons was it? Piano or singing? Piano. Yeah. Do you remember how much you charged? Oh, about 25 cents or something. Where did you and many of the other people uh, learn to play the piano or other musical instruments? Did you learn this in school? Well, I, I, I think I was about eight years old when my folks thought I should start because I was so so crazy about music anyway, and and uh, I had, a, they got me an, an organ, uh, and it was an, a, one of these reed organs that you pump this way, mm -hmm. and it was six octaves, it was an SD, oh, great big tall thing, and oh, I was so proud of that organ, I've often wondered now where it ever went to. Well, then I was about, when I was 13, then my grandfather saw to it that I had a piano, and I've had a piano ever since. Who taught you how to play? What? Your, your parents teach you how to play, or? Oh, I always had lessons uh, from somebody, uh -huh. from a town teacher. Uh, the first to pian or piano, uh, it would be organ, I learned was uh, a lady came on a bicycle uh, found to the, uh, the kids in the neighborhood, you know, to uh, have their lessons. And while she was giving the other, other young ones lessons, she let me ride that bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a bit of a favoritism, I'm sure. And I tried not to hurt the thing. But uh, anyway, that, that was my first. And then from then on, it's always been exciting. I 
kind of a boy was you in school? Well, I was about like any other boy, but more important, what kind of boy were you in school? <laughs> it's been a few years since you answered that, uh, that school bell, hasn't it, Adolf? Oh, many years. So this, is the same, this is the same building that you went to school in as That's a young right. boy? That's right. I, uh, this little entryway was put on when the school got too full and they had to make a place for the dinner pails and their clothing and stuff. The house was plum full. How many, how many were in your class? Average? Oh, I don't know. Half a dozen or eight. What are some of the memories you remember from your first days in the school? Well, uh, in those days we went to school, started to school six years. We came to our place out here in 96. I was six years old and in the fall I, I started to school. And uh, there was a, quite a house full, but it filled up more after that. There was a family, my aunt and her family came from Germany, and that brought six more in. And uh, they, had to, they had all double seats. They didn't have any single seats. They needed double seats. And uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a pretty busy place, but uh, they, they got along fine. We had good teachers. Some of the teachers came right out of the normal training class in the country school and started the teaching. You had a lot of respect for your teachers, didn't you? Oh, yeah. They were, they were good teachers. Oh, I just got to the eighth grade. How long during the year did you go to school? Well, it got so we had our six uh, months and seven months before I was uh, old enough to quit school. Before I ever, and we didn't have uh, any free grade education then. I sent, helped to send a lot of people since over my taxes. You had to pay to go to school then? No, but then you know that comes out of your taxes, you school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know a little bit about that, right. <laughs> uh, how, far, how far was it you said you had to go? Well, the schoolhouse is right. I don't know just how it be. The schoolhouse that over here on the, the land on the other side of the road. Mm -hmm. in that corner. And it's been gone so long, and so you see where the house is now. I didn't have, and the Saudi was about where their cars were. So I just, I didn't have very far to go. I could come home for dinner. A lot of the kids had to come a long way, though, didn't they? Oh, yes, the Taggart girls who live way <laughs> up in the northwest corner, or, or yes, up there, that way, northwest corner. And they had a long ways to come. It was about two miles. They had to come. Mm -hmm. And the same way with a family by the name of a Com Converse that lived out here, they had a long ways to come. Do you have any certain memories about school? What was a, what was a school teacher like? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. It was mostly women, because the teachers I never did have a man teacher. What sort of things do you remember that uh, were taught that really made a big impression on you? Oh, gosh, I don't know. We used to have a lot of fun, I know, going to schools and playing. What sort of things did you used to do that were fun? Oh, we used to play pump, pump, pull away, and fox and geese, you know, when it snowed. We used to play ball quite a bit on a Sunday, mostly, you know. Neighbors would get together, the boys, and play ball. We used to have quite a bit of fun that way. The kids was growing up, though, we used to have a ball diamond over in one corner of our pasture. I bet there'd be a hundred people come there on Sunday afternoons to that diamond. Well, then the young folks would all come over to our place. Maybe there'd be about 40 young folks out there in the yard just to having a good time. That's what I like about it. My kids never had to go to other towns. That's just where, uh, that's right there up there. There were so many farm. young people, they come there to our place. No, of course, we, I always tried to have cake or something, pie or something. That was, uh, For them all to eat. They always liked to come to our place. Yeah, and that's one thing I'm happy that is about. That the balls. Right out there on our place, that's where it was. Yeah, we'd, every Sunday, we'd, they'd all come over there. And then, sure. our biggest excitement was reunion and 4th of July. 
as kids. We always look forward to 4th of July and also the re Veterans Reunion at Cambridge, and more so on account of the mill pond there at Cambridge. Uh, Lake Livonia? Yeah, Lake Livonia, that's right. And in the winter time, there was plenty of sport there of skating. There was skaters there from everywhere. <coughs> and I also remember one time when I had the reunion down there, McCook sent a special train down from McCook to Cambridge and come and took them home that night. That was the biggest attraction for us kids, was the reunion in Fort July. Was there any place that people used to go for entertainment? Like, did you ever remember going down to the Opera House in Cambridge or maybe go to McCook? Oh, or? yes, once in a while. But that there was just come very slim because when it come to that, why, us little guys, we didn't have the price when we was sitting out here on the hills and uh, breaking sod, planting sod corn. Yes, I think they have. They're not in for, they've got to go somewhere. They got to go off somewhere, just shows and things like that before they can enjoy themselves. People here in the country would enjoy themselves their own way, you know. They'd have dinners and they'd have uh, company and, and parties and, and get togethers there in the farms, you know. Not always they, they're in town, you know, they got to go somewhere to have a good time. What, uh, what sort of events around Cambridge bring back the most acute memories for you? Well, one of the things is the, the uh, dances that I took part in <laughs> organizing and running the dances. We had some real good times. It was a sort of a uh, invitation. Where were these dances held? In the second story of the Opera House. This is the Cambridge Opera House that yeah. burned down That's many right. years back. Yes. What, uh, what sort of activities, obviously the dancing, what sort of music uh, usually have live? Yes, oh, yes. We, uh, principally two ladies from McCook. And one played the piano and one played the violin. Very fine music. We had real good times. There was no roughness around there at all. Everything was on the up and up. Sometimes somebody would come in that wasn't invited, but if he uh, conducted himself all right, why, well, OK. Well, I used to work on the stage at the Temple Theater. That was uh, down in the next block. And uh, there was an old. Uh, a stock company, I wouldn't say it was an old stock company, but it was a stock show, stage show. We'd have them five or six times a year. And uh, one of the uh, nice people that I had met and w worked with on the stage was old Doc. You remember Doc? You know Doc of Gunsmoke? Yes, Melbourne, Melbourne, Melbourne Stone. Stone. He's one of my old friends. Oh. And I worked on the stage a lot with Doc. And, uh, oh, there was, there was a lot of old, uh, Stars are they're all gone, most of them are gone now. Mm -hmm. Sally Rand, I was, managing, I was managing Fox Theater over there, and uh, I brought Sally Rand in to put on a show. Sally Rand Sally, put on a show Sally, in McCook, Nebraska. Sally Rand put on a show right here across the street in McCook, Nebraska. What was community relation? Uh, what was the community reaction to that? Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> if I'd uh, if I'd had a box office in the alley that night, I'd have filled the place. <laughs> but uh, as it was, why well, we let the people in the front, and uh, I lost a, a few friends over it. Uh, there's a few people, uh, influential people around here, that wouldn't speak to me. I didn't have any crowd at the theater. Uh, people were afraid to come in. But uh, she put on a good show, and. Uh, Nothing risque, everything was clean. You can go down the street right here this afternoon and see more than you so could see in the Salaran show. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how uh, you and Mrs. Newcomb uh, first met and uh, a little bit about your courtship. <laughs> well, I tell you, as far as courtship, we met the dance, really. And then, well, we were together through years before we got married. 
And, He's uh, forgetting about the box supper that we, he bought my box. I, I bought a that box. That was about the first time no. we ever went any place oh, together. We've been to, yeah, that was the first time we ever went any place together, but we met at a dance and then went to box supper. Do you remember how, remember how old you were when you first met? Yeah, in our teens. Uh, how old were you when you got married? I was 24. How about, how about you? That 23. Make you 23, then. You, so you know each, knew each other for, what, about 10 years or so then before you got married? Yes, we, uh, well, maybe not that. About six or eight years, I guess. Uh-huh. What, what was courtship like in those days? Horse and buggy. buggy days. Horse and buggy. <laughs> Rides. Yeah. A lot of picnics. Yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I, picnics, and Sunday we carry that out picnic. with our children. I know I used to play golf quite a lot. I heard my daughter say, well, we, I don't suppose we can go out for a picnic today. Dad'll be out on the golf course all day. That was on a Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, quit golf right then and there. Haven't played since. So fam family's always been real important to both of you then. That's right. What sort of activities and things that, as far as a courtship, do you remember that have changed maybe since the days when you were growing up? Well, quite a bit, because when I was growing up, it was a horse and buggy. And if a young man had a nice little team of ponies and a red plush seat and a top buggy, he was lucky. The girls were, really went for the guys that had the buggy and the nice ponies, huh? Well, why wouldn't you? The ceremony was about the same, but it seemed like there weren't as many, uh, church, there weren't church weddings so many as there are now. It would either be a home wedding or they would go to a judge's office or a justice of the peace. And sometimes they wouldn't know to bring witnesses mm -hmm. and they'd get whoever was there and I'd serve for that many times. Social life, activities, fun, and games were all a part of those wonderful years. But the mainstay of the Plains people's existence was still in farming and the business associated with it. Pretty hard life. Were they able? Were the crop prices good? Do you remember your your dad talking about that much? Oh, he sold lots of corn for ten cents a bushel. You did don't he, believe that, he? do you? You know, I believe it now. I'm not going to argue with you again. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, were they? Were the farmers? And uh, you know, we was awful lucky if we got fifty cents for wheat. Mm -hmm. That's when I was a kid. Was a, what were the farmers' attitudes? Were they, did that sort of... Uh... Oh, they didn't. Uh, nowadays, these folks don't know what work is. They fly off the handle and everything. But uh, then uh, men that settled this, the land up didn't. They kept their cool. What, um, what sort of activities do you remember uh, as far as the politics, the Grange? The Grange was pretty strong out here. Well, it wasn't... A, 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 uh, there wasn't a, a whole lot. You had, to, if you, uh, the people had to make their own fun. They'd get together, you know, and have and doing dinners and stuff like that. If that's what you mean. Mm -hmm. How about how about political groups? The farmer organizations were they? We didn't have any. Not in my day. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any famous people coming through this area? Oh, yes, there's... Um, a man from the Cook came down and... Senator Norris? Over. Yes. He came down and talked to you. Do you remember what he said or what he was like? Oh, no. I don't dare to say what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> 
we drove the, the, cap, the cattle from Lebanon to Cambridge. And uh, there was one old cow they didn't think would make the trip. So I hauled her in our truck. Now our truck didn't have any cab on it at all. It was that older model. And so they put her in and tied her to the front of the truck. And she had her head over me and was slobbering all the way to Cambridge. So we stayed overnight in Cambridge. And then I think I brought the cow on out here and they drove the cattle out. And a, a, a terrible storm came up. Uh, one, of, one of our spring blizzards. And we didn't get back to uh, get the rest of our things for a week. But we found the chickens just okay. They hadn't had feed or water or any attention. We thought they'd probably all be dead, but they made the trip then on up here. You showed me also an interesting piece of, uh, of gear that you don't see too often anymore. Would you like to tell me what this is? Well, now this was uh, a hook they used to harvest their corn. It's a left-handed hook because Claude was left-handed. They'd put a outing flannel mitten on, they wore it, and put this over it. And they'd pick up the ear of corn and take the shucks off with that, rip them off, and throw the ear into the wagon that was going down the field with a team of horses. They had to be kind of gentle and used to it. And on the opposite side, they had uh, a higher board. They called their bang boards and they'd hook, the, hook this over the shucks and snap the corn and throw it into the wagon. And they guess so they could just walk along. They didn't look at anything but just the corn. You'd just hear that bangity, bangity, bang, people going through the field. And then it was put in a crib. They had to unload that that night. And it was, well, at noon, too, they would if they had their load. And uh, put it in a wire crib, and then the corn shellers came around and shelled it. Or you fed it to your pigs, uh, whole. And sometimes the boys would shuck through the field when they, come to, when they came to school, and maybe even shuck when they went back home. What, uh, what are some of the things you remember, both of you, uh, remember about, say, this, the sort of customers that would come in the store? Do you think the customers have changed any? The, from the customers of today? Well, I would say this about, as I remember it, they, a lot of the early settlers lived on their uh, aid money, and they didn't have cream stations. They sold butter, and we just bought butter. And they'd find out how much was coming to them, and they'd get the essential things and say, we've got to save a little so we can get things at the drugstore and hardware. Is this how they made a lot of their payment then? Not, they didn't pay by cash then, did they? Was it like a bartering system? Yeah, they uh, lived mostly on their produce. Uh, then they would pay off debts when they sold a crop, you see. Uh -huh. And it was a little difficult to turn people down. That was my failing probably, being a little too easy. To, if if uh, <clears throat> I knew that the family need things to go to school or children, why, I just couldn't resist charging it to them. So I lost a lot of money that way. So we had, so we had a lot of, uh, oh, a lot of different ways of payment then. And you, uh, you got to know all your customers pretty well. I guess oh, that, yeah. that hasn't changed too much here in Cambridge, the town Later this Later years, they brought wood in to pay their grocery bill when we were down at this store. Oh, yeah. Brought yeah. in lots of wood. So they brought wood and butter and eggs and just about anything you could grow out on a farm or get out on the farm then to, yeah. to buy the things yeah, from yourself. Egg, eggs were nine cents a dozen, butter 19 cents a pound, calico 10 cents a yard. <laughs> <laughs> was, there, was there anything? Work shirts 49 cents. You don't have any of those left, do you? <laughs> when the, I think the big thing uh, that helped farming one way was transportation. Uh, I had to, I'm, well, I, it works every way. Now, if a, a fellow out there breaks down, he can come to town. Well, we used to have blacksmiths around. Some farmer in the country had a forge and one thing or another. But now they can get in the car and they can come to town. Next thing on transportation that I think has helped so much is these trucks. That's a big thing. Well, they go right out there 
and load a load of cattle. And when they harvest now, there's the biggest change. Last time, well, for years up there, I don't know how long. I'm still interested out there. I've got interest in wheat and cattle and stuff. <laughs> they come with two big combines and they load that in trucks of 600 bushels or something and would take it to the elevator to Eustace, store it there or sell it or whatever they want to do with it. Now we used to have to scoop that in the bin, <laughs> scoop it out in the wagon, and then dry the team in town. But I kind of enjoyed that. I used to kind of like get that load of wheat and start to go to town, visit along the road or something, you know. So that's one, one thing. And then the amount of acres that they can farm, that's the biggest thing. We've got fellows up north of us there that's farming. 20, I believe they said 2,600 acres of corn this year. Well, gosh, we used it. We could. Well, listen with a single row lister, we used to figure if we got eight acres a day, we was doing a pretty good day's work. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that's it. That's a big change. That's a big change. Does ever the news pretty much comes to you now? Well, it does, and the newspaper business has changed so in these years. We use the telephone a lot. And uh, people do that, and people come in more. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't report just for personals like we used to. Everything now is stories, it seems. So in the old days, then they would just have like personal news items, mm -hmm. and At, oh, once in a while there would be a big story break, mm -hmm. but uh, not like it does now. Well, I remember crop failures. I remember that very distinctly. And I remember very good crops. I remember uh, the last year I was on the farm, I, I shucked corn, and corn was tough to pick. And one day, I gathered 70 bushels of corn. Going back a little bit before the Depression days, let's talk a little bit about probably one of the first major national crises uh, in your lifetime was the involvement of the U.S. in World War I, our first major uh, venture overseas. Do you remember the overall view of the people around here, how you personally felt as we started being drawn into that war? Well, of course, the, what brought it on was the, the U-boat, the German U-boats that are destroying our fleet and our, our transportation. And uh, that, they were pretty upset about that. They didn't have any love for the Kaiser and his ilk. <laughs> You're, you mentioned that uh, you had relatives from Germany, and this is a predominantly uh, German area as far as the immigration. Was there still strong loyalty to the United States at that time, even, because, even though German was uh, probably the greatest ethnic group in this area? Well, there was only a, just one here and there that was in sympathy with Germany. Uh -huh. And the rest of them, if they were, they shut them out. But I don't think there were very many. I don't think there was. My folks were both born in Germany and came to this country. Uh -huh. Well, I don't know if uh, World War I, uh, everybody was for Everybody was patriotic. Everybody was, our men were leaving, and uh, I, was, I didn't have to be in it. I was a little young, but uh, most every person was patriotic. It was about the time you got married, I remember. You said you yeah, were married in October. Yeah. So World well, War I had already. I didn't, I wasn't in World War I. At that time, they had, uh, rationing came on and uh, I was on the county rationing board and uh, Frank Butler uh, said I'd be more valuable on that board than I would in the army so uh, I was deferred but my number was then I was Jake Craniger and I our numbers were drawn just before the, about the time the war was over but that was one reason I wasn't in was the uh, for that reason 
What sort of things do you remember from this time? Well, from, from yes, right away, uh, it, we were married in 1913, Frank and I, and right away, the war broke out, and it it uh, uh, developed a lot of extra things. Mr. Brown, who was in the bank, uh, organized a group of minute men, you know what they would be. Yes. They would go out and help to sell bonds, government bonds, and uh, they'd have, be prepared to talk for a minute. My husband was one of them, and he always wanted uh, me to go and there'd be somebody that would uh, sing. Mm -hmm. And we spent just miles and miles of going around to the schoolhouses and things like that. Well, yes, the, uh, clear up until after World War II, I think that the veterans had a, had a very deep place in, in people's hearts and in their, they were very enthusiastic during World War I. And there was quite a German set, settlement, you know, around Eustis, and they were Germans. And they were, they were wanting to show that they were Americans. The boys about all went along. I think some of them uh, volunteered mm -hmm. because they wanted to show that they were, they were good Americans. So a, there, there was a lot of pride then? Yes, there was, there was pride in it. And if you had a soldier over there, why? They, they kind of respected that, you know, and could live it with you. Mm -hmm. Was there any special ceremonies or any special activities when a bunch of the servicemen would be leaving town? When they'd be taking the train out of town? Was there? Well, the people would go down to the train. And there's one occasion why they hung the Kaiser in effigy to show their support. Mm -hmm. and, and their, one of their main songs was over there. There may be another, be others, probably will, but that's the one that I that stayed with me. So people really singing these sort of songs oh, here at yes. home during the war. Oh yes, yes. You mentioned a little ditty that you heard of from the First World War. Yes, they used to to say that Kaiser Bill went up the hill to get a look at France. Kaiser Bill came down the hill with bullets in his pants. <laughs> what was the reaction when World War One was over? They have any celebrations here? In yes, America? the morning that the World War I ended, I was practically sitting up waiting for it. We'd had, of course, we'd had a queue that it was just about over. But the whistle started blowing, and I, uh, I grabbed a flag. I, I had a real five, I had a nice five foot flag, put it on a pole, and I come downtown. That was about four in the morning. Come down North Avenue, and the people were coming in every direction. Not a huge crowd, but I presume there was probably 150. And we had started marching up and down the street with the flag. We started to fire down uh, uh, at the corner of Norris and C Street. A big bonfire uh -huh. right there in the middle of the street. Of course, no paving and it didn't bother anybody to have a fire. But uh, we started to fire. And our, we formed a parade, and we turned this corner, went over, and we got the mayor out of bed, made him come down, and he come down and marched with us. We built up the fire some more, and we had a huge fire. And uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, businessmen of the community come down and joined us. And uh, a lot of shooting, a lot of noise. Is that pretty typical, the way Nebraskans celebrated uh, oh, yes. events? I think, uh, I think everybody celebrated that way. But everybody was, everybody was patriotic. And then after, after the armistice in 1918, then you came back and you, you came back yeah, to farming? Yeah, and you know, there was an awful lot of them come back from overseas, you know, and was discharged. And us truck drivers, there was just a very few of us left. And by gosh, they kept a hold of us there just so the officers could have a job. <laughs> yeah, a few officers. Uh, I didn't get home till I think it was the 22nd of May, 1919.
After the war years, great rejoicing carried our country forward until 1929 when the Great Depression, dust storms, floods, and other natural disasters took their toll on the Plains people. really dropped out of farm produce. What, what was it like being a banker then? What was it like being in Cambridge then? Well, I wasn't in Cambridge then. I was up at Trenton. Oh, Trenton. Okay. And I was running the bank there. Well, I went through the depression of 21 and through the 30s, and I got through all right. And uh, I didn't have a thing to do. I didn't have to put any money into the bank or to cover any losses. I had plenty of reserves, and uh, I was one of the fortunate ones. There was uh, one, two, three, four banks that had trouble, two banks that didn't have any, three banks that didn't have any trouble. In the county, we had 10 banks in Hitchcock County. Now there's four, correct amount. <laughs> What's a, what were the major things you remember from the from the Depression days? Were you uh, involved? We had dust, the Dust Bowl in certain areas of the country. Did that affect this region of Nebraska at all? I was, uh, I and the family went right after school down to Texas to visit my folks who lived near Wichita Falls. And uh, I'd, I'd call up here every few days to the cashier and see how things were. And he says, uh, we turned the lights on this afternoon at 3 o'clock. And I says, what did you do that for? Well, he says, it was just dark with dust, dust storm. It was terrible. And uh, I, I, I couldn't imagine it, you know. Never seen anything like that. All well, those were desperate days. That is, uh, I made farm loans for the Federal Land Bank and I've had several farmers come in and ask me, offer me a deed to their farm because they didn't think they could make it. And then I'd talk them into staying and they come out pretty good. Well, I would say from 31 to 39 was tough years. Eight years of crop failures. A lot of farmers had to leave their farms and some businesses were closed where, they, where the banks wouldn't carry them, couldn't afford to possibly. Those were the uh, toughest experience that I ever went through, those eight years. Well, I'll tell you, a lot of us, uh, those old farmers, they didn't have it very smooth none of the time, to be frank with you. Yeah. But they just put up with it. I bet you wouldn't know. I wouldn't know either. And the years. And the hours and the minutes move quickly by, and the days fade away, and the moment never to be revived, shadows of the A bad flood in 35 that just pretty near ruined this uh, area and that was what why these that got my husband so uh, interested the lives that were lost there were about 112 people that uh, died in that flood and then it's when he became so interested and started this uh, uh, reclamation work mm -hmm. and he is the, really the one that started all these lakes and dams around here mm -hmm. 
so it was the 35 flood that really mm -hmm. started getting his interest mm -hmm. in it. It's time to come down. But our boy had just got it's home time. from the Army, and him and his wife bought a home here, and here come this flood. And all that saved him, they got a chair and put on the bed. He chopped a hole through the ceiling so they could crawl up in the attic, and they got up there. And then the floor gave away. Everything went in the basement. But they got out alive, but then that was about all. They didn't have any family at that time. Well, a peculiar thing there I remember was uh, we had a toilet in the basement here, and it's still there, no doubt. And the pressure was so great that it backed the water up from the river through the sewer system. And uh, somebody was uh, wanted something in the, from the store. So I came back to get it for them. And uh, I could hear water running. And I went down there and uh, it was just like an artesian well. The pressure was so great that that was just forcing that big stream of water out of that toilet. And it was all over the basement. The, uh, the way we stopped it, uh, I went out. And I remember seeing Ernest Fiddler, a plumber, on the corner up here by the bank. And he came over, he said, have you got a bunch of sacks? And I said, you ever got a lot of sacks? And he wound those up and stuck them down there and in the thing and stopped it. And then we went, found the fellow that was in this place right over here, Jim Hammond, I guess it was, ran the clearing office there a while. And uh, we got a hold of him and took the sacks down there and stopped that because it's seeping through the wall. And that's the main thing about that flood that I uh, remember. Uh, I know we had quite a loss down there. I was down here at Decoration Day, and, and uh, I had my family with me, and we started home toward evening. And uh, I saw that uh, big cloud clear across the west. It looked very ominous. And uh, I told them, I says, we had a detour to make and a steep hill to go up. I says, now, if, if I can make that hill before it starts raining, I think we can get home. And we made it. And uh, we went to bed, and as soon as I was in bed, it started to rain. But then I went to sleep, and I never realized until I went downtown, looking south down the road, right straight, there was a house went across the street, uh, road. And uh, three people perished in that, in that house. And uh, I never had such a helpless feeling as I went up on the north side on the hill, and I knew there were people, my friends, down there, and I couldn't do one thing for them. That was the most helpless feeling I ever had. Shadows of the past, memories which, if not preserved, will never last. Much can be learned about the future if we will only take the time to study our shadows of the past. Shadows of I think I've lived through the best period of our country, the very best. And from now on, it will be downhill. And I haven't much to worry about because I haven't very many years to be around. But that's the way I look at it. I was fortunate I lived in the best period of our country. I can't say that I've ever been dissatisfied with my life in Nebraska. I 
and went. I've been a lot of different places. I was always glad to get back. So. No, I've always been satisfied here. Always had. We always had neighbors in the country. Always had lots of good neighbors. We've got awful good neighbors right here where we live in town. So I don't know of anything that I'd want to change. I'm satisfied. I've had a very happy life here, and I feel like I have have done a lot. I have helped my husband all those years, and I enjoyed that newspaper work so much. I can't think of any time that I was so uh, overwhelmed, uh, I, and I can't think of any time that was was just filled with uh, music and fun. I can't think of any time it wasn't. Just, uh, I loved life. I like to live. Why, why do you think museums are important? Well, it keeps the heritage alive. You'd be surprised at the little children that come in here from these school groups, that uh, the interest they have in what it used to be like to survive. You think people today are interested in keeping touch with what happened in their past? I believe they're becoming more interested. I know they are here because our attendance has really picked up in the last two years, and uh, especially the school groups. And the years, and the hours, and the minutes move quickly by. This program has been funded in part by a grant from the Nebraska Committee for the Humanities, a state-based program of the National Endowment for the Humanities.